Coming up on Stu Does America, Democrat voters continue to try to figure out whether they believe anything they've said for the past two years or if they're going to vote for Joe Biden. Dave Rubin joins us about his new book that he is politely requesting we do not set on fire. And Arthur Brooks attempts to tell me why I shouldn't just be sulking in the corner during the pandemic, despite the fact that sulking is the thing that I am best at. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and click the bell for all notifications and rate and review this podcast on iTunes. You can write 24 paragraphs about how awesome the show is. That's fine. Or just write, it's great. Whatever. Either way, the more reviews you give, the more people show up here. And I appreciate it. And if you want to be a super special, important person, subscribe to blazetv.com slash stew. You'll get everything from us, plus Dave Rubin, uh, and a lot more. Make sure to use the promo code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Plus, you'll save 30 bucks. Now, as we search for happiness, remember, if you're a small business owner shuttering your doors right now, you can always think about the fact that absolutely no one in the government has lost their job. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Dave Rubin is coming up in just a moment. He has a new book out called Don't Burn This Book. Don't you tell me, Dave, whether I'm going to burn a book or not. I'll be the judge of whether or not I burn your book and quite honestly, whether or not I burn anything else. I hope for your sake there's nothing in your book that I disagree with because then it's toast. And so is the bookstore that's selling it. And probably the forest where the trees were harvested to make the paper too. I bought the matches, I bought the gasoline, I'll put it wherever I want. I thought this was still America. Don't tread on my right to light things on fire. It's called freedom. Now I got that rant out of me. I want you to know it's sort of a strange reaction to want to set something on fire just because you don't agree with it. It's really kind of a warm way of stating, I disagree with this so much, I'm going to illustrate it by this bonkers behavior. There's a bit of a strain of thought that exists in our politics today that's related. Yeah, there's censorship, there's pressure campaigns, there's cancel culture, right? We gotta have all that down. But allow me to introduce you to a new and increasing trend among Democrats in 2020. Now, I don't know if Joe Biden did criminal and horrific things to Tara Reid in the 90s. I do know that the media coverage has been completely inconsistent with previous and similar situations. And I know there's far more evidence here than with Brett Kavanaugh, for example. Now, to me, the most convincing evidence that this actually did happen is what Tara Reid says occurred immediately afterward. She claims that when she pulled away, Biden said, quote, oh, man, I heard you liked me. Then she said he pointed a finger at her and said, you're nothing to me. After that, she said he shook her by the shoulders and said, you're OK, you're fine before walking away. Oh, man, I heard you liked me. You're nothing to me. You're OK, you're fine. Three rapid fire sentences, all disagreeing with each other with three distinct emotional approaches jammed into a 10 second period. If that's not Joe Biden, I don't know what is. If there was a haiku about the delicious taste of the dog treat sausages mixed into the account, I would be willing to forego a trial and put him in prison right away. But most people seem to find the most, uh, corrob the most impressive evidence, I guess, is the corroborating witness that just came forward. Uh, and she's the neighbor of Tara Reid, Linda Lacasse. She was a former neighbor of Reid who said emphatically that she did remember Reid talking to her about the exact incident about, I think, 25 years ago. She said, quote, this happened, and I know it did because I remember talking about it, Lacasse said. But the strange part occurred later as Lacasse tried to clarify that she wasn't some opportunistic political opponent. Quote, I personally am a, am a Democrat, a very strong Democrat, she said, and I'm for Biden regardless. But still, I have to come out and say this. Wait a minute. You said you know Biden did these horrible things and you're still going to vote for him? Like, 
you're knowingly voting for a guy that committed sexual assault. I thought maybe this was an isolated incident, but then Lisa Bloom, known feminist attorney and daughter of Gloria Alred, tweets this. I believe you, Tara Reid. You have people who remember you told them about this decades ago. We know he is handsy. You're not asking for money. You've obviously struggled mightily with this. I still have to fight Trump, so I will support Joe, but I believe you, and I'm sorry. Wow. I'm sorry, too. I don't even understand. What? We can all agree that someone who walks up to a random staffer delivering his gym bag and throws his hands inside her lady parts is among the worst people in our society, right? Like, we're all on the same page there. Maybe it's short of murder? child molestation but really it's right up there and this isn't some passing flippant tweet it's a feminist attorney tweeting all the evidence in the case and still giving this verdict what is happening now it's an ongoing law of twitter that if some blue check mark has tweeted a crazy thing there are probably thousands of randos who have tweeted it as well usually with more psychotic intensity a few examples that have been making the rounds today i would vote for biden if he raped a hundred women at gunpoint the stakes are high this election. Yeah, I guess they are pretty high. Even if Biden sexually assaulted me, I'd vote for him. In fact, the off chance that this had happened, I encourage people that meet this criteria to vote for him anyway. Or if Biden had raped my child, yes, I'd still prefer him over Trump as POTUS. Remember when the left mocked Trump for saying that people would still vote for him even if he shot people on Fifth Avenue? The president isn't known for his subtlety, but I don't even think he makes that comment about raping a hundred women at gunpoint. Speaking of Trump, now would be the time in the conversation that those on the left will note that he also has been accused of sexual harassment by several women. And that's true. But here's the thing about every Trump voter that I know, at least, they don't believe the accusations. Let me say this very obvious thing very clearly. If you think Donald Trump raped someone, you should not vote for him. But wait, I really like tariffs. I'm sorry. It's not good enough. I know. Uh, you shouldn't vote for a rapist for president. Mm, these, sta these hot takes I have to make these days in the media. Now, of course, the left believes the accusations against Trump because they believe every accusation against Trump. And if you're on the left, you might even think some Trump supporters are going out of their way to convince themselves that he's innocent. And maybe that's true too. But at least they've taken the time to do it. That's more than I can say for you. There are only two options for the left here. Either admit that your previous standards that were applied to people like Brett Kavanaugh were wrong against the American system of justice and that you've entirely abandoned them or you're voting for a rapist. That's it. Here's the handy dandy Stu Does America guide to navigating these incredibly difficult decisions. It's okay to vote for someone if they weren't accused of rape. There's your best case scenario. Only gets tougher from here. It's okay to vote for someone if they were accused of rape, but you've done a serious and reflective look at the evidence and sincerely don't think they're guilty. That's totally fine. I mean, a candidate shouldn't just lose everyone's vote after every accusation, credible or not. That insane kind of standard popularized by every Democrat on Earth until two weeks ago just incentivizes false accusations. In the very suboptimal circumstance where there is no legal system available to figure these things out, you have no choice but to judge the facts that you have at your disposal. Next. It's maybe okay to vote for someone if they were accused of rape, but you're not sure of the truth. Now, look, it would make me pretty uncomfortable if I had to cast a vote for someone that I wasn't relatively certain whether they were a part of the same club as Harvey Weinstein or not. But at the very least, there's an assumption of innocence until guilt is proven. So maybe you could at least justify this. However, it's not okay to vote for someone if you think they raped someone. I know we live in America in 2020, but can we have higher standards than that? I don't feel like this should be a hurdle that is too difficult to clear. 
Of course, there will be many on the left who see this as a race between a rapist and another rapist. Yes, Biden is guilty, but so is Trump and global warming and stuff. I know this isn't the most popular point to be making these days, but I'm going to make it anyway. If you think you're picking between which candidate is the better rapist, and I don't mean better at raping, but I mean like the better overall person who happens to also be a rapist, then maybe, just maybe, it's time for you to consider voting for a third party. I think Justin Amash seems to be running. I don't know. Jill Stein seems to be always be running for something. Even Phil Collins is running for president. Now, it isn't the Phil Collins from Genesis. No, I'm sorry. His name is Phil Collins, though, and he's running as the nominee of the Prohibition Party. Vote for him because you know what? He might take away your glass of rosé, but on the other hand, no one seems to think he's a rapist. Yay! I mean, I know the two-party system uh, has a hand, uh, you know, all over your throat, and it's a hard habit to break here. Uh, but you're willingly voting for someone you think committed sexual assault? I mean, jeez, get off Twitter for five seconds. We mock those that burn books because they disagree with the arguments inside. But are you really any better if you try to get someone elect elected to run the free world that you believe, that you believe, is a rapist? I don't think so. Now, all of this may be very hard to remember. That's why we came up with this easy, easy guide, and it rhymes. Here it goes. When you vote, red or blue, always note whether you think the allegations of the candidate inserting his fingers into a random staffer against their will are actually true. And if so, don't vote for them because then you're voting for a rapist to be president, and that probably says something really terrible about you. Blue, true, you. It rhymes. So for all the Democrats in this difficult time, remember to play it safe and don't vote for someone you think is guilty of rape. I'm Stu and I approve this message. Stu does America. Now, maybe you're making some really bad decisions in your life right now. Maybe you're in the middle of this quarantine and you don't even recognize yourself. A lot of that has to do with pain. A lot of people go through pain every day. And then one of the sad things that we've learned over the years is that people who have ongoing issues with pain, whether it's back or neck or shoulder or leg pain, they've kind of given up. A lot of them, I think it's something like two thirds of them have just given up. I've had this pain for too long. I'm not going to try anything else. I've tried everything. That's, that's, it's understandable, honestly. If, if you don't treat inflammation, it can cause permanent damage and it's constantly annoying. Pain relievers and topical uh, creams don't uh, treat the problem, they just mask it. Omega XL, though, goes right to the inflammation. It's backed by 30 years of research. Omega XL is a powerful natural supplement that helps reduce pain due to inflammation while it promotes uh, healthy joints and increased mobility. Nothing like it in the world. They're the only people that use this ingredient from this one little place. It's like they kind of like, they're like in one of those movies, like dove into a, like a cove and then into a cave, and they've taken all these little things that no one even knew were there, and they put them in here in Omega XL. They're the only people in the world who have this stuff, and it works. People love it. Omega XL, research, research shows that it can help with, uh, promote a healthy immune response, and that means Omega XL can help your natural immune system protect you. Here's a, a special offer to get you started. Uh, right now, you can order, and you get your second bottle absolutely free. For more information, go to OmegaXL.com slash stew. Omega.com uh, uh, excuse me, OmegaXL.com slash stew. Make sure you use the slash stew part because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Or call them at 800-844-4888, 800-844-4888, or OmegaXL.com slash stew. Dave Rubin is the host of The Rubin Report, which you can get as part of your Blaze TV membership. And of course, the author of Don't Burn This Book, Thinking for Yourself in the Age of of unreason. Now, Dave, I do see a few negative reviews uh, on Amazon about the book. Uh, uh, none of them seem to have verified I, I, purchase next to them, I've noticed. I mean, what do you think is the cause of that? Stu, the <laughs> trolls are on the march. <laughs> They're attacking. I'm under assault by the trolls. I mean, look, you know, it's funny. The title of the book, obviously, Don't Burn This Book. The whole premise of the book is that what I lay out in this 
in these 240 some odd pages are pretty common sense ideals, belief in the constitution, individual rights, standing up for what you believe in, thinking for yourself, not just accepting dogmatic authoritarian views because that's what's handed down to you by mainstream media and the rest of it. Uh, but in, in 2020, we don't burn books anymore, right? This isn't the Reichstag fire. We don't burn books, but what do we do? We assault their Amazon reviews. We send <laughs> trolls to copy and paste things over and over and coordinated attacks. So it's actually kind of hilarious. I've been having some fun with it on Twitter because it's like, you know what, if this is if this is the best you guys have, not attacking my ideas, but attacking me personally or lying about what's in the book, it's like, man, pick up a copy of this book. And if, if this stuff angers you to the point that you have to anonymously sit there all day and attack me, well, the, the problem is not mine, my friend. <laughs> it's very true. It strikes me as the case that you're making in the book is essentially one for honesty, right? Honesty and self-examination. You are looking for people, and I think everybody needs to be in this position, where you're looking at your views. Uh, am I right? Am I on the right side of this? Am I just reflexively... Uh, answering these questions because of whatever hyper-partisan side I'm supposed to be on. We started the show with an example of this that seems to be spreading, which is people who believe Tara Reid's accusations against Biden mm -hmm. and still are going to vote for Biden. And like, where, what, what, what are you saying about yourself and your own value with, with, with a state stance like that? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you're bringing it around to a current event because the Tara Reid thing is such a perfect example of so many things that I lay out in the book. Not only the intellectual inconsistency, I mean, the very same people who said, believe all women, who are now are saying, well, believe all women except some women, right. particularly that woman, yeah. you know? So, so that's one thing. It's like you're showing, you're showing that your principles are not principles. They're just sort of malleable political things that change in the wind. That, that's one part of it. But Another part, as you know, one of the chapters is on fake news, and one of the types of fake news that exists, I talk about four different types, and when people think about fake news, they usually think, oh, it's a, just a made-up story. That's the, sort of the most generic type of fake news. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, another type of fake news, as you know, is when there's a headline that says one thing, but then the content of the story says something radically different. And then there's another type of fake news that I think is the most nefarious, which is that the media ignores stories that, doesn't, that don't fit their narrative until they can't ignore them any longer. And the Tara Reid story is the exact perfect example of that because for all of us that are on Twitter and YouTube and, and social media, it's like we've been hearing about this Tara Reid thing for probably, I don't know, six weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And the media, mainstream media, and when I say this, I'm talking specifically about the New York Times and CNN, completely ignored it because it was their guy, meaning it was a Democrat and Joe Biden, when we know the exact opposite happened with just accusations, right? So I'm not saying the accusations are true with Biden. I'm not saying they were false with Kavanaugh. I'm not even taking a position on accusations in and of themselves. I'm just talking about the way the media treats a story when it's their guy, meaning a Democrat, and when it's the bad guy, meaning a scary Republican. And I think all of that is being unearthed. And, you know, I wrote this book, I finished it in July. And the fact that it's out now in the midst of all of this uh, and, and so many of the, the, the things that I write about are, are hitting home right now. It's uh, timing is everything, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And I think it's in a weird way, you know, bad for book sales that there's no bookstores open. That is definitely part <laughs> one of the equation. But there is more time, I think, people for people to actually read and maybe take some time to contemplate, you know, what, where they're going in their lives. Um, you know, we've seen this kind of act out in the coronavirus situation generally where, you know, people, uh, you, you can see this grasping, some people grasping for authority at any cost, some people wanting to push back and fight back against authority at any cost. I mean, you're in California, you're in a situation where they're closing giant patches of sand uh, because uh, they're telling you you're not allowed to go outside. You know, I, I find that this is a, an interesting thing that authors are going through right now. You know, Glenn just released a book. We went through a press tour with that, with an idea that this is going to be released during an election. Uh, you know, you, you're coming out with a book at the same time. Coronavirus uh, kind of, I think, reveals different layers of, of your thinking. Um, did you find that to be true as you've kind of gone through this and re gone through all these uh, thoughts again? 
Yeah, it's really actually a beautiful thing because I think what's happening to almost everyone that has their head on roughly straight in America <laughs> right now is that you're starting to reevaluate your positions because suddenly you may be thinking, boy, the institutions I believed in maybe don't function the way I thought they function, or maybe the supermarket that I always thought was gonna have food isn't gonna have food, or my job isn't as secure as I thought, or I don't wanna commute the way I used to, or a series of other things that it's important for us to think about. And, and I'm seeing interesting things happen. So one, it's like, this does expose a lot of hip hypocrisy. So it's like, you've had half the country screaming for five, or, you know, four years now in effect, that Trump is Hitler and his supporters are Nazis. Now, of course, that's that's insane mm. and ridiculous. But what they're also calling for is they're saying, but he also doesn't do enough. <laughs> and it's like, well, I guess maybe, maybe just maybe um, you don't really believe he's Hitler because suddenly you'll want to give Hitler a lot of power. So let's just say he's not Hitler. Can we agree on that? And then another thing that I'm finding is there, this is a really beautiful thing that I really hit on in the book is that suddenly for the first time in, I have no idea how long, lefties are calling for states' rights. Mm. I've got all blue check progressive people who hate Trump suddenly now saying, okay, well then leave it to the states. And it's like, yeah, you guys are suddenly into federalism, okay. You guys suddenly care about the constitution, all right, we'll take it. And then I would say on the counter side of that, for the more liberty-minded people, so that obviously includes us, um, you know, there's a there's a real moment here, which is, you know, we can all talk about freedom, we can talk about liberty, we can talk about limited government, but as you pointed out, I'm here in California, and as the government encroaches on my rights, tells me I can't go to the beach here in SoCal, it's like, why am I paying these property taxes if I can't even go to the beach? <laughs> so, so, you know, it's putting, it's the rubber's meeting the road in my own life right now. I mean, I really, I, I've been tweeting it out, you maybe saw it, you know, I've been thinking about Texas for the first time in a long time. And uh, as I told uh, Chad Prather earlier, it's like, I'm just waiting for Glenn to put together a nice little welcome package and maybe we can make this thing happen. <laughs> it's a great place to be. I will I will say that I'm from the Northeast, so I'm uh, not a Texas yeah. guy, but I love it here. I never want to leave. Um, let me give yeah. you one more on this before we go to break. And then I want to I want to go back uh, deeper into the book. Uh, when it comes to you're in you're in California, and I think this has been a d difficult situation for everybody to handle and figure out. You know, it's not an easy one. This is not this is not. It's not simple. Um, you know, look, we're facing something really real and the, and the level of government control is, 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 is very debatable. Um, it, it's also very counter to the American experience where we all want to kind of go out there and just fight. Like that, that's what we want to do in a situation mm -hmm. like this and we can't mm -hmm. do it. So if you're governor of California right now, what is the vibe? What, what are you doing? How much control is appropriate? And what's the, what's the speech you're giving to the people of California right now? Well, this is the true danger of having progressive politicians in any position of power. Progressive politicians, as far as I can tell, but I'd be happy to be proven wrong. I actually wish I could be proven wrong on this. They, they have no grounding principle other than the government should do everything. I have no idea what a progressive ethos is other than government. So the problem is that in moments like this where we're unsure about the future, where there is a pandemic, where the economy's hurting and all of this stuff, well, they view that as a wonderful opportunity to use more government power. So it's like, if you're gonna close down the beaches and, you, and there's a real reason to do it, well then how about you tell us exactly why you're doing it and why you said we're gonna close them all down and as opposed to laying out markers on the beach where you would say, okay, four people can be in each one of these squares and they're six feet away from other people. Mm -hmm. And you know, like give us something that would sound like a sane policy that wouldn't completely derail our lives. But that's not really the business that progressive politicians are in. The business that they're in is saying, we've got power. Oh, there's a little vacuum here where people are confused. Let's jump in that vacuum and, and take more power. And, and that's what I'm very concerned about. And, and fortunately in, in Texas, you guys have Greg Abbott and he's trying to open up the state and maybe there'll be some bumps along the road. You know what I mean? Maybe there'll be a little spike or something like that. But then, but then you honestly fight through all of those mm -hmm. things so that we can move forward. Because I got to tell you, I, I don't want to live in my house for the rest of my life. I got a great house, but I, I got to get out. <laughs> yeah, I want to see the sky again. A restaurant would yeah. be nice. Uh, don't Burn This Book is the name of the book. We're going to come back with more with Dave Rubin here in just a second. We're back with Dave Rubin of Blaze TV's The Rubin Report and also soon to be Texas resident Dave Rubin uh, has joined us. Uh, Dave, I, I want to go into something you go into uh, in the book. And 
I, I feel like at some point when I think this, of, I, sometimes I think to myself, social media is a big part of this, the, the screwy way we're dealing with each other right now. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, that's not really a good hot take. Like it's, it seems, I feel like I'm boring. Um, it's a boring take. Um, however, you really lay it out in, in an interesting way. And I think like we get to this point where I think we're constantly convincing ourselves. And I think we know inherently that this is not a good influence on our lives. But I have a real problem um, saying that and then doing the opposite. I find myself, especially in this era, back in front of this thing all yeah. the time. And I don't think it's helping my life much. Well, you know, social media and big tech in general and our iPhones, all of this stuff that we really are just adolescents with. You know, it's like mm. you, I, you're I'm guessing you're about my age. It's like, you know, we grew up in a time before cell phones, yep. uh, you know, we before before handheld everything and the internet and the world in your pocket and the rest of it. And for the last 20 years, we've been fed all this stuff. We thought it was all for free. What we didn't realize is we were giving up all of our own data and personal information and affect our digital souls is what we sold to these guys. Um, but you know, like anything else, the phone is like a hammer. I mean, it's a tool. It's 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 a it's like fire. You know, fire is great in that it can keep you warm and it can cook your food. And fire can also burn down your house and cause massive destruction. So it sort of is a thing, and it's how we treat it and how we use it properly that I'm really interested in. And in chapter ten, in the final chapter of the book, that's really where I dive deep on some ways that I think we can treat our relationship with social media a little more maturely. Just a couple things that I can give you quickly are, you know, I really am a firm believer. You should not have your phone in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. your, your morning should not start by looking at Twitter and having an anime fox tell you you're an awful human being, or even just scanning through, even if it's just scanning through Facebook and seeing baby pictures, and then suddenly you see the news and then a Hitler meme and then some other cartoon thing. And it's like, that's not the way you're supposed to start the day. You're supposed to start the day, probably you gotta pee, and then I'm guessing you, ha you have some water or some coffee and then you can get going. But to start your day in that digital world, I think is a terrible idea. And then also, to the same point, ending your day with the last thing you do before you close your eyes is, again, scrolling yeah. social media and the rest of it. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't have a Kindle and you can read and stuff like that. And of course, I'm not here to lay out hardcore rules for people. I, these are just guiding principles that I think have helped me. You know, I try to do much less social media, if not completely off on the weekends. Unfortunately, in the midst of coronavirus, you know, weekends and weekdays <laughs> have sort of melded into one yeah. weird thing. So, mm -hmm. so that I haven't even really been following my own rules on that. Um, but the other thing that I do that now a lot of people have been joining me for, for the last three years, I've done August off the grid. No phone, no television, no news. And it can be very hard to do because wherever there is a CNN, where there, uh, sorry, wherever there is a, uh, a muted television, CNN is on. So if you go to the pizza place and it's muted, you know it's CNN. You go to the airport and it's muted, you know it's CNN. So it's hard to avoid news, but you know it's fortunate that you know I'll go to the gym and people will say, "Come on," they'll come up to me, "Dave, come on." I know you got your phone in your pocket. You're not really off the grid, and they'll keep me honest. And I got to undo my pockets and go, "Guys, no phone here." And what I've realized in the three summers that I've done this, the three August, is that it gives your brain a chance to reset. It allows you to think about things a little bit differently. It re I think it actually allows your neurons to kind of connect a little bit better, get some of that tissue going. And I find that you know, look, right now it's like if you're if you're meeting a friend. Remember in the old days when you could meet a friend somewhere when I you do, were trapped yeah. in your house. Mm -hmm. Well, you remember you'd meet a friend on a corner. You'd say, meet me on that corner at seven o'clock. Now you're waiting there at seven and they're a few minutes late. What do you do the whole time? You stare at your phone. Mm -hmm. But it was, only, it was only 20 years ago that you'd meet a friend on a corner and if they were a little late, you'd just stand there. You'd just stand there and look at people, look around, see your surroundings. And I think we are starting to forget some of those little pleasures. And I think it's important that we don't become essentially what the movie The Matrix was about, which is that humans, our organic selves, will just be the batteries for the digital world. Uh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big sci-fi guy, and I re recently watched The Matrix again, and it's like, man, they were on it, because you know we're starting to, if you spend more than half of your day in the digital world, well, then what, which world is more uh, relevant to you? Right, it owns uh, we, we need to think about these things. We never seemingly, I mean, we only got about 30 seconds left, but we, we seemingly never had this conversation, right, where we were going to turn over, you know, 40% of our waking hours to devices. Like, I don't remember ever agreeing to that. It's so unintentional, and I think that might be the biggest thing you're kind of focusing on here. Make it intentional when you're using it. 
Stu, they turned on Skynet and they didn't tell us. And now we got to clean up the mess. <laughs> it's sad. It's sad. Dave Rubin, host of the Rubin Report here on Blaze TV. The book is Don't Burn This Book, uh, th Thinking for Yourself in the Age of Unreason. We'll all let Glenn know, uh, you know what area of Texas you're looking at and we'll get that all squared <laughs> away. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for doing this and coming on the program. I appreciate it. Thanks, Stu. Appreciate it. All right. Back in a second. With the stay-at-home orders, uh, Americans are putting on the COVID-19 uh, pounds uh, because that's where I am right now. If I'm at only at 19, I'll be shocked. I'll be shocked. However, I'm ready to turn it around. I think today's the day. I, I'm going to start uh, diving into the world of Fast Blast. Fast Blast is great. Uh, even before the insanity of the world was kind of discovering uh, uh, in, in intermittent fasting, um, you know, there is a there's a really highly successful way to lose weight. Um, and intermittent fasting is interesting because I like it because I'm, I'm a bit of an extremist. You know, I like when I when I think something's right, I want to do it. I'm not good at like, well, I'll cut nine calories a day for the next 47 years and then I'll lose six pounds. I like to go all in on it. And here's the thing. Like when you have uh, intermittent fasting, you could take a couple days uh, a week. This is the way they have it. They design the whole system for you. It's great. Um, but, you know, it makes it easier to lose weight and keep it off than some of the traditional stuff because it's hard to stay on that all the time. Fast Blast Smoothie is something that they have put together as well. It's formulated specifically for intermittent fasting. You get great energy, fewer cravings, and the best part is it's very simple and it tastes great. It's not like yucky aftertaste world. You don't have to deal with that. You take one every couple of hours and, and that's it. Keeps you full and you do the fasting days as well. Do your own homework. Go to fastblast.com slash blaze. Fastblast.com slash blaze. Get started today with Fast Blast for a healthier, happier, and smaller you. It's fastblast.com slash blaze. Arthur Brooks is one of the most important voices in America today. His TED Talk about how we can serve those in poverty with capitalism has been viewed millions of times. He wrote the book, Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. And lately he has been continuing his work studying happiness at Harvard. What does make people actually happy in a lasting way? His podcast is The Art of Happiness with Arthur Brooks, and he started a series of columns with The Atlantic, the first of which we'll tweet out from at Stu Does America. It's entitled The Three Equations for a Happy Life, Even During a Pandemic. I think if you ask people right now which make, what makes you happy, most people pretty much just growl at you and mumble something about going to a restaurant. Uh, so, Arthur, why is this a good time to start a column about happiness? <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. Great to be with you. Um... It's the best time because people right now are thinking about happiness a lot and they have a lot of time to think, quite frankly. It's amazing how I ask people how they're doing in the pandemic and, you know, a lot of them have a lot of complaints, but they'll also say, you know, I'm, I got more time to think than I have in the past. I'd like to be able to improve something or two about my life. And so I started this column and I have to say the, the reaction has been overwhelming. People are saying, yeah, these are good things for me to be thinking about. And um, I like that. Who knows? They wouldn't come out better when we went in, right? Yeah, I, I mean, look, that would be that's what I think everybody wants. I know I'm going to be up at least 20 pounds. Uh, that's already I'm already priced that one into this equation here. There's some negative habits that have developed, um, but I think it's a really it's a really good idea. Um, and you kind of talk about this. And I think it's interesting because we we consider happiness as this sort of ethereal, like loose thing that it's hard to put a, your right. finger on. And you, you do a good job of trying to boil it down to what its essence actually is. And there are studies on this um, as they go to, you know, measuring your own happiness. And you came up with you kind of outlined the equations here and I want to go through them. But first, yeah. how hard is it for people to actually measure their own happiness? Yeah. Are people actually good at that? No, they're not. Uh, and part of the reason is because they're they're paying attention to their moods, which is what psychologists call their affect. Positive affect is a good mood. Negative affect is a bad mood. And you think when you're in a bad mood, that means you're unhappy. You know, happiness is a much more stable thing. It comes from basically three sources. About half of your happiness is genetic. You got it from your mom and your dad. So if you're unhappy, it's your mom's fault, basically. <laughs> At least 48% or so of your happiness, you can call mom. Uh, on the other hand, if you're an ebullient person, I mean, look, you, you look actually pretty... Pretty happy to me, man. Uh, I mean, your parents have a lot to do with that. Okay, now that's important to know because if you're a person who tends toward gloominess and bad moods, don't beat yourself up. You've got half of your happiness to work with. That half actually goes into circumstances in your life, kind of good and bad luck, what's going on, and your habits. Everybody wants to change their circumstances. If I can get better look, uh, if I can get better luck, if I can get better relationships, if that girl doesn't break up with me, if I get that uh, that job, if I get that promotion, that raise, I'm going to be happy, happy, happy. No, you're not. You're going to be you're going to be temporarily happier. 
Most of your happiness actually comes from your habits, which is about 25% of your happiness, but that's under your control. And so that's the stuff I like to talk about. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, the, the, the genetic part of that shocked me, like that, that the research would point in that direction. I wouldn't think that, that yeah. would be much of a big part of it at all. It does make me happy that I can blame my mom for my problems, and I will make sure she'll, she'll, be, she'll be hearing them from me later. Uh, but I do think that there, that is like something that is, I, I think, stunning to the, the average person to hear that that's that big of a factor. Yeah, for sure. The way that they figured that out was by looking at studies of twins, where they got a ba database of twins that were born between the mid-1930s and the mid-1960s, who by happenstance were separated at birth and, and, and they were adopted to separate families. And so they were able to bring them back together as adults and figure out how much of their personalities were genetic, you know, nature versus nurture. And it turns out that somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of almost every part of your personality is genetic. I don't want that to be true. I want to be tabula rasa. I'm an American. I want to build it my own way on the basis of my hard work and merit and personal responsibility. But it turns out that our genetics really do matter in our personalities. That's, that's really interesting. Um, you bring up habits as well. And to me, habits, I mean, I feel like every, at least most people I know, the habits have gone out the window since uh, you know, Corona time <laughs> started. It's, it's been a disaster. But that's not really what you're talking about when you're talking about habits. It, it's, it's, it's a different formula of how you're coming to that. Yeah, for sure. So we're talking about habits of health. Absolutely. Everybody watching us should exercise an hour a day. I recommend doing it first thing in the morning, getting your hour of exercise. I recommend you know, don't eat too many empty carbohydrates, all that stuff. You know, the comfort eating, you got to stop. But those are exactly right. Those are not the habits that I'm talking about. There are four habits. They're a portfolio of your happiness. You got to put a deposit in each one of these accounts every day. Faith, family, friendship and work. And your work has to be toward work. I don't care if it pays or it doesn't. I don't care if it's taking care of kids or volunteer work or for money. It has to serve others and where you can accomplish your own success, earn your own success. But what people do, a lot of people watching us who are real workaholics, they neglect their faith and their family and their friendships, especially men do this. And this is one of the reasons that men tend to be particularly lonely and unhappy in their 50s. This is a, an avoidable error. So of all the guys, but women too, watching me today, Put a deposit in your faith account today. Do something tangible. Say your prayer. Sit in meditation. Uh, put something in your friendship account. Call friends. And, and, and don't social media doesn't count because you actually don't get the benefit from social media. You have to actually get on your technology to see each other and make sure that you call your mom, even if it's just to say, how come you made me unhappy? <laughs> uh, this is, uh, you, you outlined this, this, this structure of, of, um, of habits in, as I'm as I go through it, it's like it's particularly hard hit right now. Faith, you can't go to church. Friends, family, yeah. you can't get in person with them. Uh, work, you can't go to work. Uh, you combine that with something I've been toying, uh, tossing around a little bit, which is, uh, and you kind of alluded to it a second ago, the American spirit is when something like this difficult, you know, happens, you're out there to fight. Like you want to be out there. I want to do something about it. I got to get out there. And we're told like the best thing right now for us to do is to not do that. So you combine all these things together, and this is one of the more difficult uh, challenges I think we face as, as the American people when it comes to actually becoming uh, happy for any lasting period. Yeah, that's true. And, and part of it is that there's a lot of fear that comes from this inactivity, a lot of uncertainty. And this is one of the things I've written about as well. One of the problems that we have with uncertainty is it stimulates our brains to, it stimulates a part of the brain called the amygdala that, that makes us feel this fear. And when you have uncertainty, you don't know what's going to happen. You know what the probabilities of anything are. You know, is it going to go on for six months? Am I going to lose my job? Is somebody I love going to be sick? What's going to happen? Are my kids going to be able to go back to school in the fall? Whatever. That's sort of stimulating your amygdala and making you feel this adrenaline and uh, discomfort and unhappiness. It's very important for us to recognize that <clears throat> when we're binging on news, I mean, everybody should be watching The Blaze, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but when people are watching, you know, three, four hours a day of TV and looking at the Internet to see how many people got sick, how many people died, which a lot of people are doing, they're spending all their time in media. It's because they're trying to take uncertainty that gives them discomfort and turn it into risk, which is something you can manage because you know what the outcomes possibly are and their probabilities. The, the insurance industry manages risk professionally. We try to turn uncertainty to risk all the time by getting more information. You can't do it about the coronavirus. You can't. And so don't binge on news. Limit yourself to half an hour total of news every day. And then say this to yourself, which is what psychologists tell cancer patients to do. Say to yourself, I don't know what's going to happen next week. I don't know what's going to happen next month. But I can tell you I'm alive and well today. 
and I'm not going to waste the gift of this day. I refuse. Lean into the uncertainty and live this moment. It's very empowering, and it's a very good habit, actually, even when we're not in the coronavirus lockdown. Hmm. When you talk about um, doing these things to, to reach, at some point, a, hopefully a, a lasting level of satisfaction with your life, uh, you really make the point that it's more, much more relative than I think most people would consider. It's not necessarily how much you have. It's how much you have as compared to how much you want. Um, and you break down that formula. It's a really interesting way of looking at it. It's also, in a way, a sad way of looking at it because it, it seems mm. to be a, a never-ending treadmill. Yeah. You know, one of the things that when young people ask me, I'm on college campuses. I mean, I, I, I work on a college campus, of course. I teach at Harvard. But when I'm talking at other colleges, you know, they'll say, well, you know, what are two pieces of advice for happiness? The first is that I tell college students and young people is that don't let anybody pathologize your unhappiness. Unhappiness is a completely normal part of life. Sadness is a really healthy thing. It can be too much, of course, mm -hmm. but just the fact that you have unhappy feelings is not evidence of depression. It's not evidence of something terrible, and you need it to learn and grow. That's number one. But then number two is what you just alluded to. Satisfaction with your life is your haves, all the stuff that you have, divided by your wants. It's, a, it's just a little fraction, haves divided by wants. Most people think to get more satisfied, they have to work in the numerator, make the haves more, mm -hmm. grow the haves. That's exactly wrong because your denominator will always sprawl. It'll always stay ahead of that. Your wants will always, you know, because this is how we're wired. This is, you know, people, we want more and more and more. This is not a evidence that we're terrible. It just means that we're trying to stay alive in some way. So therefore, what I recommend for people to be more satisfied is to manage the denominator of their satisfaction equation. Make an inventory. What are all my wants? All my, my physical wants, all the, the things the relationship wants. I want people to like me. I want to be famous. I want to have power. I want pleasure. I want money, whatever. Make a list of all those things and say, how am I going to rein that in? How am I going to... And it's funny because I was working with the Dalai Lama about this. And one time he told me that that he, he said he the first time he went into a, a, a supermarket in the West, and he went in and he said, I mean, this is the, the, the greatest Buddhist sage in the world. And he, he looks and he goes, I want everything in this store because it's so beautiful. I mean, all the, you know, we take it for granted that oranges and apples and bananas on the right when you go in and all the canned goods and stacks and stuff, it's, it's, it's stunning. And it makes, makes your want sprawl like the, the suburbs of Atlanta. <laughs> and and you, need to, you need to manage that. So forget about the haves. Manage the wants, and you're going to see your happiness grow. Right, let me give you one, one last question here. Uh, you, yeah. you write in a piece about how you know, you're teaching a class about happiness and how a lot of people think that's strange, right? It's not accounting yeah. or anything. And it, it does strike you as strange a little bit. Is it part of that, though, that the American people in particular feel that Pursuing happiness in some ways is sort of selfish, right? Like we always are talking about how hard we're working and how we're, we're you know, we're sacrificing X, Y, and Z and focus kind of on ourselves and our, self, our, and our happiness in particular kind of comes off as, as, as selfish, at least to the American mind. And maybe that's not the way we should be thinking about it. Yeah, well, it turns out that happiness is the secret to success, not vice versa, because of the haves and wants thing. Right, right. And so therefore, if you want to be a successful person, and I don't mean physically successful, successful in life, you need to manage your happiness. Furthermore, unless you manage your own happiness, you can't help manage the happiness of other people around you. So very critical to, to remember. And finally, remember the, the four secrets to happiness are faith, family, friends, and work. For you to be happy, you got to be putting a, a, a deposit in those four accounts and when you do you're going to be bringing a better life to more people in other words you have to pursue your happiness to the max to the best of your ability so that you can bring more joy and happiness to other people and that's really i believe the most sacred thing of all arthur brooks uh, author of love your enemies how decent people can save america from the culture of contempt of course these columns are in the atlantic make sure to check out his podcast as well arthur i really appreciate you doing this this is this is great stuff and very much needed at this time Thanks very much. It's great to be with you. And thanks to the whole audience. Stay right. happy. Stay safe. <laughs> thanks. We're back in a second. I mean, today's show, you got great guests. I mean, I was fantastic as usual. I mean, this is worth the entire subscription. Just this show. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. Make sure to use the promo code Stu because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Plus 30 bucks off. We'll see you tomorrow.